Hello, everybody. This is Josh Acton, and I'm uh, excited to have you today on a new offering, a course that OSL is offering and I am uh, leading. It will uh, entail a, a six-week process. There are six classes, and they'll all meet uh, at the same time uh, today, and it's uh, 10 o'clock uh, California time. We're meeting live. And um, the title of the class is Vacationing in a War Zone. And it, um, it is meant to be an introduction, but also some training in spiritual warfare in today's world. Um, we live in a world that uh, is so entangled in profound deception and violence and hatred and we see it all around us. We've become accustomed to it in a certain way. But this warfare is, is not just waged on the outside of us. It's also uh, going on within our own souls. And this is a, a war for souls, a battle for souls that's happening. And as Christians, we know that we are assured victory in Christ, but we have to be able to learn how to stand in the battle in order to, um, and how to fight, how to be willing to fight with the weapons of our warfare that God gives us um, in order to prevail in the various battles of our lives. Because these are not going to be um, often, you know, these Cecil B. DeMille movie, Cecil B. DeMille movie type experiences or, or anything like that. They might be very little things, very little irritations and very, very, little um, um, things that seem to distress us or annoy us. And we just think of it as nothing big, but it's all part of the battle. And so I wanna, I wanna be able to talk about this in a way that gives you a really strong uh, theological and biblical foundation in spiritual warfare. And yet at the same time, I want to be able hopefully to provide practical ways that we engage in this warfare and ways in which we can find victory in all areas of our life. And uh, so hang with me. That's the plan and that's the hope. And I think we live in a time when it is more um, needed than ever before um, to be able to see the battle that's actually going on. Vacationing in a war zone is kind of a, a, a title that came to me because many of us do not have any awareness that we're living in a war zone or that life is somehow um, uh, filled with all kinds of supernatural activity. And we um, go about our day and our life feeling um, perfectly um, comfortable to a certain extent uh, with uh, who we are and the environments we live in and we, in a sense, turn a blind eye to the fact that there is this uh, evil power at work in the world, and we just kind of ignore it, and we go on with our, with our lives. And it's a way of kind of choosing to not see something, choosing to not listen to something or be aware of something. It's a selective attention, and so that's why I call it vacationing in a war zone. Um, so... As I said, um, the course is going to teach you to recognize attacks of the enemy, how to fight back, how to experience victory. You'll learn how to develop uh, a strong spiritual foundation, ways to pray. Um, and um, if you already know a lot of this stuff, this is going to be a helpful um, strengthening of what you already know. Um, so we're really glad that you've joined us today. Uh, so before I begin, I just want to share something, which is just kind of an example of how warfare, we, we can call it warfare now, um, uh, even though we might think of it as just being happenstance, to look at the larger picture, um, we can look at the little irritations and problems and challenges as, as actually things that we're meant to, to engage as a kind of battle knowing that we have victory in Jesus Christ. One of these, as soon as this class went on uh, online and was advertised and um, was 
uh, put on the OSL website and, and was put out there into the Ethernet, um, immediately my whole family got sick. <laughs> my um, The same day, uh, my family, I'll just say my family, uh, they came down with uh, bad flu, bad symptoms, high fevers, all kinds of things. Now I know that's going around and I'm not necessarily making the connection, but I'll tell you how it continues. Um, when I'm trying to put this, this class together, I was the only one that was, I was doing okay. Everybody else was sick. And uh, I ended up getting this um, sickness right on Christmas day. And I developed a super high fever. Um, for me, it was like one, um, it was high, one, 103.9 or something like that. It was pretty high. And I was, uh, in that place for a while and was very sick. And, uh, and eventually I came out of that. I was able to do Christmas Eve services and I wasn't sick then, but boy, I got hit on Christmas day. Then as I was getting better, I was beginning to minister and get back into the groove of things and working on this, these talks and so on. And then I got uh, a really bad bronchitis, which almost lapsed into pneumonia after I'd already recovered from this other illness. And so um, I was given medication for bronchitis and pretty serious cough issues and um, respiratory problems. And then as I, um, you know, I've been recovering from that. And then on New Year's Eve, I went with my family. We went to the theater and watched a movie. And I developed this little like a little bump in my gland, in my like salivary gland. And it wasn't a big deal, but I thought, where did that come from? That it's like this, this um, swollen gland there. And it wasn't there before and it kind of hurt a little bit. Well, within about an hour, this thing blew up. This thing got huge and I still have it. And if some of you are looking at me going, I didn't realize you, those that know me, that Josh actually had two necks. You didn't realize that, did you? So uh, I, that's part of this glandular infection that's happened uh, in, my, in my salivary gland that's happened all over my, my neck here. So usually I look a little more svelte than this. So um, it's been an issue. And so uh, I have to look back and I look at the content of what we're talking about and how many people it will go out to. And, and you kind of wonder, you know, maybe... These are all little ways that the evil one uh, wants to not let out a broadcast like this. Now, I know I'm not the broadcast, you know, to watch on this. There are a lot of people doing these kinds of things and doing them much better than I could. So, uh, but my point is, is that when we begin to move in ways that the Lord would have us move and we start to uh, stand and not turn away from the the powers at work in the world, then we find ourselves um, a target. That's why if, you're, if you are moving in Christian leadership and you're growing in your spiritual life, you need to understand that you're moving, now you're swimming upstream now, okay, you're upstream against the forces of, of evil and against the forces of uh, darkness in this world. And the more you pursue that, the more you become a target, the more those powers pick up to, to oppose you. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who gives us the victory, right? The greatest of victories and power that we have at work in us, knowing that Jesus is able to overcome all of that, already has by the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we are unafraid, but at the same time, we need to realize what's, we, get, we need to get a realistic lay of the land, Christianity is ultimately a realism, it, realism in its deepest possible sense that the Christian is trying to understand reality. And when Jesus says, very truly I say unto you, and then he goes on to say something, the literal translation of that is, is this is the real, this is the really real. When he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, when he uses the word truth, the word means real. And so we're dealing with realities. We're not dealing with fantasies or fairy tales. 
we're dealing with the truth. And so um, let's begin. That was a, by way of long introduction. Do you ever wonder what's going on in the world today? Do you ever look around and say, I could not have imagined things happening today that we take as normal happening even five years ago. And it's so rapid. It's almost like we're in a different, um, someone on the television one time I saw, they said, sometimes I think we're in an alternate universe. We've switched over into this other universe. And, and I sort of understood what they were talking about. Yeah, it feels that way sometimes because the, the changes are so rapid and dramatic and appalling at times that we just say, I can't believe that we live in the kind of world that we live in and the kinds of things that we see as normal now, we would have, um, we would have just thought were um, bizarre uh, just a few years ago. So I wanna read you some examples of what some, these are Christians by the way, so I don't wanna pick on some other group, but these are Christians um, who have They've talked about the, the question, why is there so much evil in the world today? And their answers were interesting. One 50-year-old uh, Christian man, he says evil. He says, people just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe they had the wrong genetic cocktail when they were born. Some things are unexplainable. Some things just happen to whomever happens to be there. That was this particular Christian's viewpoint. Another Christian, a young person said this, suffering happens to all of us to teach us to embrace joy and happiness. Everyone suffers so we can empathize with each other. Another one says this, this person is also over 50. Nothing happens by accident, even accidents themselves. It is all for a purpose and a reason in each person's life. Somebody else wrote this. This person was uh, a young um, person in their early 20s. There is no sense of karmic balance. I'll say that again. There is no sense of karmic balance. Just because something awful befalls someone does not mean it is any more or less deserved than anyone else. Bad things happen. Um, so those are just some of the examples. Notice none of those examples none of those Christians who were interviewed brought in the idea of an evil source to evil. <laughs> there was no, no mention of the devil or no mention of anything like that that you would see in scripture, but they were, they were trying to figure out evil. And I think that people do that. They try and do it um, without using uh, the framework that the Bible gives us which is looking to this, um, this in a sense, a, a dark world, a world, a dark kingdom that is brought into this world by Satan. And it's not talked about. It's even among Christians. It's just people shudder to even think of some of those things. The theologian Gregory Boyd writes this. He said, if you disbelieve in the reality of good and evil spirit spirits, you fundamentally change the narrative of Scripture the motif of scripture is spiritual warfare, and it is through line of both it is through the line of both Old and New Testaments. And in the New Testament, the meaning of what Jesus was doing in his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection, is fundamentally tied up with the belief in spiritual warfare. Take away Satan, and you take away one of the most fundamental reasons Jesus came to earth. And then C.S. Lewis wrote this. He says, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. Give me a thumbs up if you give a cheer for C.S. Lewis on that. He's really telling our story. So um, I'll share with you now, we're going to look at this, this idea. And the first point I want to make with you is um, that God invariably deals with all our problems by giving us a greater revelation of himself and his love. 
God deals with all our problems by giving us a greater revelation of himself and his love. Now, our part is to choose whether we will continue to operate in the inferior reality of our circumstances and the way we understand them, or walk in the higher reality of his love, in this revelation of his love. And this is the, this is the choice. Will I walk in the revelation of God's love, or will I walk in my own estimation of my circumstances? Does that make sense? Um, the kingdom is dynamic in Scripture. If you look at the New Testament, in the New Testament, we'll start there. Although there's so much to be said in the Old Testament, and we'll talk, touch on some of those themes. But in the New Testament, the whole thrust of the kingdom of God is that there is a reality uh, that is breaking in on an unreality in a certain extent, that, or, uh, or um, a kingdom of being breaking into a kingdom of non-being, or another way to say it would be a kingdom that is true breaking in to a kingdom of lies, Okay. So this inbreaking of the kingdom of God is the purpose of Jesus coming to earth by his own words that he said he came into the world, right? He comes into the world to initiate this conflict with this kingdom of darkness and that he is representing the kingdom of God and he is the king of this kingdom, Um so uh, the kingdom is breaking in. It's God's dynamic rule. And it is the center of Jesus's message. And Luke says it's the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what the gospel is. The good news of the kingdom of God. Um, and if you look at uh, this, and if you want to begin with a, a scripture, it's going to be important probably for some of you to you might want to have your Bibles open for these studies because they're primarily Bible studies. Most of the stuff we're going to talk about is getting into digging into Scripture. So, um, but the the uh, reference to that is Luke four forty three, the good news of the kingdom of God. We are in therefore a conflict because there's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom of darkness, and. Um, and this kingdom conflict is what you and I have been born into. We have come into this kingdom conflict. And um, we need to understand it as a, it's a multi-dimensional sin war. A multi-dimensional sin war. Jesus preached the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And he preached this that Satan's kingdom was being dismantled and that he would, uh, he, he's telling us, keep in mind because all teaching and everything I'm doing is about this inbreaking and establishing of the kingdom of God. Um, and so if we think about this, um, when we understand the kingdom of God, we also need to always understand the kingdom of God as moving forward and breaking in. It's not, a, a realm, okay? It's not set up as like, you know, a kingdom like we imagine in, you know, the mo movies, you know? Um, it's not. It's not the enchanted kingdom, okay? It is a kingdom. The word, the, the, the word better is translated according to a lot of scriptural scholars is the, the, the kingship, of Jesus Christ, the the reigning power of Jesus Christ, the reign of Jesus expands here and there. Wherever Jesus is, the reign of God is pressed in to the darkness and dismantles the darkness. So it's not just setting up a, a kingdom like a status quo. It's when you think kingdom, you're always thinking moving forward, moving onward, move, moving to uh, break down um, evil to dismantle injustice and darkness and 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 to rescue and to heal and to do all of that it 's a dynamic living powerful reality that we live in called the kingdom of God, and it is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the king 
And so where's our scripture for that? This idea that we're caught up in this, this multi-dimensional sin war, um, this, these kingdoms in conflict. The scripture says, uh, Matthew 12, 28 through 29, it says, Jesus speaking here, but if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come among you. If it's by the spirit of God I'm driving out demons, then you know the kingdom of God has come among you. And in verse 29, he says, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. Okay, that's a dynamic, powerful kingdom moving forward and taking back what belongs to God. In John 12, 21, Jesus is, is um, in this hour of agony. He says, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. The prince of this world is what Jesus called Satan, the prince of this world. St. Paul will also call him the God of this age. Um, so as we continue, you see Jesus is also talking about this driving out, um, this this. Um, cosmic deliverance, kicking the devil out, uh, breaking down the kingdom. Um, and in Acts 10, 38, it says, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Um, so he went around healing all those who were oppressed by the devil meaning that the captors that, that the devil had taken, Jesus released them. He freed them. He was, the, he was the special ops that went in there and released them and freed them from their bondage and from their imprisonment. And that's what Jesus is still doing today uh, un, until uh, the fulfillment of the time when he returns and establishes his kingdom all in all. And the fullness of his kingdom is established um, when he returns. And so I share that with you. Uh, um, I, I, I love this passage too. I wanna to share with you Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. I'm just trying to get this idea of your understanding that when we say kingdom, we're talking about a kingdom advancing against a kingdom of darkness. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So he's setting people free who have been in fear their whole lives. And um, this, this is war. This is liberation. This is... Um, this is ultimately a, a conflict that Jesus wins and Jesus has already won, yet the cleanup operations are happening now in real time. Matthew 12, 28 through 29 says, but if it is by the spirit of God, you've already heard that one, already did that one. Here, here's the one I wanted to read to you. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son." He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you ever go into a theater and you um, you first go in, it's very dark and um, it's hard to see anything at first. And I always notice that you know it's kind of hard to see. And then after a while, you notice that your eyes adjust to the darkness and you start to see everything in the theater, and you really don't have any problem at all. And you, everything seems very normal and no problem. You watch the movie, 
And then uh, this has become your normal, um, in a sense, you, that you're, you're in, in that normal kind of environment where you can see, even though it was dark when you first got, got in there. Now, you have, you, have, you have accommodated the darkness in such a way that it becomes the, your way of seeing now, okay? So that when the movie's over and you move out into the light and the sun is shining outside, it's overwhelming. We, we can't, we have to squish our eyes together. It's too bright. We cringe. We may even go back. We go, wow, that's bright. We might put sunglasses on because we cannot see in the light anymore because we've spent so much time in the dark and becoming accustomed to the darkness that our eyes are now offended by the light. Does this make sense to you? Is that when we finally see the light, it becomes a something kind of like we can't, it's, it's disorienting to us. And so it's like if some of you're asleep and somebody flips the light switch on in the morning when you wake up, you're just like, you can't take it in. And that is a little illustration of what it's like for most Christians, I believe. <clears throat> when you are being transformed by the renewal of your mind, one of the things that is happening is that you are learning how to see in the light again. Learning how to see by the light of Christ again. And not letting you, letting the darkness be your norm. Um, so I... Uh, I'm going to continue here a little bit more, and and this idea of we're in a multi-dimensional sin war, we become um, we become in a sense we've given space to the darkness. It becomes now normal for us, and so now we look at a world we live in we wouldn't have recognized even five years ago, and now it becomes sort of our norm, and um, and this is because of the 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 uh, spiritual darkness effect of. Of it creates a kind of, of vision for us that we get used to. And the problem is that when you turn to Christ and you follow Christ, it means that you have to move out of what you might be more familiar with and move into uh, the light. And the light is so much and so powerful and so great and wonderful, but it, you might be a little disoriented in your life. And I think a lot of Christians, they feel a calling upon, an urgent calling of God on their lives, but they don't know what he wants them to do. What do I do? Where do I go? Um, I'm disoriented. I don't know where you want me to be, how you want me to respond. And to a certain extent, that's understandable. And that doesn't mean you're not walking in the right direction. It just means that as in any adventure with the Lord, there is a period of disorientation um, because you're leaving the normal and you're moving into what is brand new. Um, some of you may have heard of a phrase called, um, you know, Stockholm Syndrome. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, it's an interesting phrase. It happens a lot. Um, the term was first used in like 1973. There was like this attempted bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden. A man robbed a bank and um, uh, he took three female hostages. They were together for 131 hours. And during that time, um, he really terrorized them. And uh, uh, he put in nooses around their necks and threatened to hang them if they, if they did any harm to him at all. And, but here's the weird thing. After spending 131 hours with him, when he finally surrendered, um, everybody expected those hostages to have a very antagonistic viewpoint towards their hostage taker. And, but instead, it turns out that they feared the police more than they feared the person that took them hostage. Uh, they said they didn't hate the guy that took them hostage. And they even later refused to testify against this man. And one of the ladies eventually became engaged to him. This is called the, um, this is called the Stockholm Syndrome that I'm sure you've heard of. And you see variations on that theme. Um, what happens when our hostage taker uh, provides us in a very, um, in a very rough way, with certain needs that are being met. And we then accept a new way of being in the world and getting our needs met 
but at its root, it is all about having to give up our freedom. And really sin, all of sin, there's, sin is simply uh, ways in which we creatively give up freedom. That's all sin is. Um, the promise of sin is going to be, oh, I'm going to feel better, or it's going to be easier, or I'm going to get something from this. There's always a trade-off in there, but ultimately it ends up um, just making the chain stronger on you. And so in a sense, I think a lot of people, saved people, Christians, they live like um, they have Stockholm Syndrome. They have somehow, I love Jesus, I'm with him, I'm I'm all his, and yet at the same time, I befriended my captor. I befriended uh, the evil one, and I'm I'm befriending the evil one and the plans of the evil one. Now, they would never say it like that, but that's the reality of what's going on. I will embrace this kind of um, this kind of. Um, Crime. I'll embrace this kind of criminal, this kind of behavior, um, uh, and I will try to also embrace Jesus at the same time. And what happens is, you end up uh, being a victim of a Stockholm syndrome, and you wouldn't know freedom if it hit you over the head several times. Um, freedom is not a reality to you, um, and so I uh, I want to share that. Um, because if you understand the Stockholm Syndrome or the, this idea, you can kind of get a figure. You can kind of look at yourself and look at things that you're like, I can look at my favorite sins, right? What are my favorite sins? Are the sins I kind of, you know, it's kind of helped me back in the past, but I kind of make an allowance for it. After all, nobody's perfect. You know, I'm saved by grace and all that. Well, that's all true, of course. But at the same time, we sort of bring in and keep our hostage taker with us when the liberator is trying to set us free and get us away from the hostage taker. And in very little ways, we give up our freedom to these, in this kind of Stockholm syndrome that goes on in our lives. You look at your own life and you think, what am I unwilling to give up that I know is from the Lord? Or what am I unwilling to take on that I know the Lord is calling me to? And a lot of it has to do with, because because the the misery of being a, a captive is has become uh, less scary to us than the fear of being free and the fear of of going into the unknown and and living um, as a disciple of Jesus that the, the, the misery of the known has become our, uh, somehow more comfortable to us than the promise of the unknown in Jesus Christ. So um, if we look at Satan's kingdom of darkness and his dominion of darkness, which is what's the word that's used in Colossians 1.13, a dominion of darkness, Satan takes advantage of our sinful na nature, the flesh, which is already hostile to the things of God. Um, and he takes us captive. And sometimes we make friends with being captive. We just accept it. Uh, and uh, the spirit is now at work, uh, scripture says. This spirit is now at work, to, which means to energize, to energize th those who are disobedient, meaning that if there are areas of my life where I am disobedient to God, the, 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 the evil spirit is at work to energize that spirit, to give it more and more power uh, in its disobedience. Um, there is a tug of war going on here, and um, and it's in, and the prize is our own hearts, and it has going on every day from the time you get your head off the pillow to the time you go to sleep at night. These are realities happening, whether we want to accept them or to acknowledge them or not. I've got a lot more stuff and we have a lot more time to meet. I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep this down to about 30 to 35 minutes and we're almost done here. I want to close, um, today anyway, it was just meant to be an introduction. We'll get into the, the nitty gritty as we go on. 
Um, but I'm going to share with you a story that really um, it was like a, God gave me a living parable, like a parable in my own life that I was to learn from, like events that happened. And he said, I want you to learn from these, a spiritual truth from this ordinary event. I was a, uh, I was a, a priest in charge of a Hispanic congregation in Los Angeles. Uh, I was the associate rector, and then I became uh, also the priest in charge of the Hispanic congregation. This is in South Central Los Angeles, uh, in e Inglewood. And I, uh, we started developing, I got a team together, and people spoke Spanish, and my Spanish wasn't very good. Um, so I took, a, I took a group with me, a team, and we would go door to door. And as we went door to door, I noticed that in e e South Central LA, you know, it's a pretty rough area. Um, but I noticed that um, the Hispanic people that we were going to were actually very friendly to us and, you know, tried to be as hospitable as they could. And, uh, and I really liked it. And I was learning my Spanish was getting better and people were showing up to church. So as I went to visit them, people were starting to show up to our church. And um, it was exciting. It's fun to grow churches. It's fun to see that happen. And one day I went and the person that was usually with me uh, to go um, couldn't go that day. So I went by myself. And so I went down um, one of the streets in South Central LA and uh, knocking on doors. And there was this one uh, fence, had, a, uh, uh, had a, uh, a, a fence, metal fence, chain link fence. I went through the gate. <clears throat> I went up. It's one of those older houses. And it was, it was nice, had a nice lawn, um, you know, just, just very small. And I went up the steps. And as I'm about to knock on the door to introduce myself, give them information about the church and so on, I hear this right out of the corner of my eye. I see this something is moving towards me, okay? And I'm, and about the time I turn around, I, I hear and see this pit bull, this big pit bull just hated me. I could see the hate in its eyes. This is like this hound from hell was coming right around the house towards me. And so I, I, I didn't stand there and say, good dog, good dog. I didn't do that. I turned and I ran as fast as I could. I have my clergy stuff on and all that. And I'm running as fast as I can. And I'm anticipating, because I'm not going to make it to this fence. And I'm anticipating, because i got to open the fence and go out again, okay? There's not time. And he's coming towards me. And I'm anticipating what it's going to feel like when that dog chomps down on me. And... Um, so I, in a moment, I just, I just dive. I dive into the air. I looked, I looked like, you know, Nadja Komenichi from the Olympics long ago, you know, diving and, you know, just trying to get over that, that bar, that fence. And I didn't quite make it. I went, I, I went, I went, dove over a fence head first. There's, there's, there's cement, there's a cement. Um, sidewalk on the other side, and I dove head first, but I got my coat tied around, my dress coat tied around onto the chain link fence, fence, and I slammed against the fence on the other side. So I was hanging there like a marionette on the other side of the fence, and the dog did not get me, and I was just so grateful. Thank you, God, that dog did not get me, but man, he was barking at me. And then I... Um, I looked so ridiculous. People were walking by, like, why is this crazy gringo priest uh, hanging there like that on that fence? And what's wrong with him? And um, I eventually untangled myself and my heart just was so racing. And I, I kind of got, and I looked up at the dog and the dog was up there. Like he ended up and he went to just sit by his bowl. I didn't see this, but he had a chain a thick chain around his neck that was already connected to a post, he would have never gotten me. Even if I would have went up, knocked on the door and made my visit, the dog would have never gotten me. He could have, couldn't have come close. And then um, I remember thinking all that energy and adrenaline of putting and flying in the air over the fence. And, I, 
And who, what caused that? Well, what caused that was not the dog. It was my fear of the dog, okay? So I think I share that story because I've, I've thought about it in the past, is that all the scary things that I feel like I've had to do in my own life or, or a lot of that, uh, things or th issues I've had to face, it wasn't so much the problem itself or the thing I was facing with so itself. The things that have caused me the most problems are the imagined lies that made me afraid. So my imagined lie, which made perfect sense, this dog is going to kill me, right? But it was a lie. It wasn't true. The dog wasn't going to kill me. The reality of the situation is you're safe, okay? But what happens in our lives is we end up believing the devil's lies. And when the devil lies, that's his medium for communication. And that's the way that he creates a whole a world for us. He creates he creates the set design, the music, the musical score, the whole thing. He's studied you, he knows everything about you, and he has created a fake world in a sense. A world of non-being, an unreal world. And we fear that. And that fear drives us to become less than what God has called us to be. And so we don't go ahead with these goals that the Lord may have put on our hearts. Or we don't make these, these moves that we become too afraid to move. Oh, I could never really do that. We don't, we don't take our cities for the kingdom of God because we're afraid that they'll just not listen to us and we'll look foolish. On and on and on. We don't become the people God has called us to be or answer the call that God has put on our lives. Not because we don't want to, but because we believe the lives of the, the lies of the evil one. That is where spiritual warfare is the rubber hits the road, is dismantling, exposing the lie, the big lie. It dominates our world today. It dominates individuals. It, the lines of that lie cross over our own hearts. And so uh, I hope that together we'll be able to learn more about how to discover victory um, in the name of Jesus Christ together and uh, who we know is the King of Kings. And I'll see you next time.